Doctor, forgive me. I've been sick, and I'm mostly recovered. I feel better than I sound, and I'm not contagious. I promise. But if I sneeze, the front row may want to, you know, lean back or something. And yeah. um, yes, they are in the splash zone. Yes, they are in the splash zone. So uh, I'll, I'll just kind of introduce myself and my my co-presenter here. Um, we're from a group that uh, we call ourselves Binary Coco. Other people call us a variety of things. But uh, we're trying to start a game development company, and we've started using a, a framework, and we thought, this is really cool. More people need to know about this framework and learn how to use it. And if we can figure out how to use it, I'm sure anyone in this room could figure out and do a far superior job to us. But, uh, but we figured we could, we could kind of impart some, some useful information. Um, my name is Joseph Brower. I'll be giving the technical side of the presentation, um, which talks about the framework, um, how the code is structured. We'll bring up some source code. Uh, who here saw our arcade cabinet? Who here played the arcade cabinet? Okay, and who here liked it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll actually look at the source code of that game a little bit and talk about how it's laid out, why we structured it that way. We'll also... Uh, We'll also bring up some code from a, from a very simple game that's in a prototype stage to really give you guys a feel of how it works. Um, so that's what I'll be doing. Um, Steven will be talking about kind of the non-technical aspect, which a lot of people overlook. For example, the artwork. How does artwork get laid out? How do you need to go about that? Um, and he'll also talk about his experience with version control. Who here is familiar with version control? I mean, if everyone knows, OK, well, everyone knows. You might be able to skip that section, Stephen. They just know it all already. OK. <laughs> but uh, we use Git, and it was actually Stephen's first experience with Git, seeing as he's an artist, and typically doesn't work with version control. But we still needed a way of having that, that stuff taken care of. So I'll kind of kick us off with, uh, with the framework itself. Um, the framework that we've been using, and that what everyone saw in the arcade cabinet out there, is called Love. Um, the website is love2d.org, and it's a, uh, it's a very simple framework, um, and it is geared around Lua. So you use Lua to code everything. We'll get more into that in a bit. But the most important thing about it is it's open source under a very nice license that's friendly for commercial projects and such, the ZLib license. It is also very cross-platform. Um, out of the box, I didn't have to change any code with my projects to get it to work on Windows, Linux, or Mac. Um, then there's a nice port that's kind of in beta right now for Android, and a port for better unlock my screen here, and a port for uh, iOS is on its way. So they're they're really flexible. The community is good. They are uh, they're friendly in the IRC channel. They're on OFTC.net um, hash love. It's the channel, and they uh, they're really friendly. The only drawback about them is some of them aren't as mature as we'd like and they like their foul language or whatever so be aware of that if you go to interact with the community but uh, but they're very good very helpful and uh, very knowledgeable they like sharing their knowledge so anyways I'll let uh, I'll let Steven take this next part and then I'll uh, return and we'll go over the technical stuff right Break through walls, but I can't get down. All right. I'll stand over here. Yeah. Okay, so I started this project with Joseph about. Huh? Yes, it is. Where is it? There goes the other thing. This is going really well. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> This is being you can't see my face. Oh, great. <laughs> there, I like that. I did this right. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about uh, art in 2D gaming. I didn't know anything about programming when I met Joseph. I didn't know what Git was. I didn't know what a computer was. Uh, I took a lot of art in college. I took painting, ceramics, and I took a little bit of graphic design, but I was doing animation in PowerPoint, and it looked terrible, and it looked slow, and it looked awful. And I figured out how to use Photoshop to do drawing and I figured out how to use After Effects to do animation and that went a lot better. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of my drawing process that I have. Here's a two minute video. 
of me drawing something like you saw in the HDF game, x by Defense Force. I'm going to show you how I draw and uh, how it relates to this game, I guess. I found an eight, what, a 32-bit keyboard in my house, and I made a little song for it as well. So I don't know if the sound will play through here. All right, well, that's I'll reproduce it if it doesn't. That's probably <laughs> better for you guys. So there you go. OK, so here it's about two minutes long. I drew this picture. It took me about 40 minutes, and I t put it into After Effects and squeezed it down to two. So it's going to go so a little quickly. So the idea is you need to understand when you're doing game development, art is important, and it takes time. Does that make right. sense? Okay. So, right let's see. Is there any sound? There's no sound. But anyway, you start out. I usually start off with the main asset or the main character. I add my layers. You know, you mess up a lot, but with computers, you can go back. You know, kind of makes you wish that life had a back button. <laughs> anyway, so. You'll notice that when you start out doing an art project like this, it doesn't look like anything, and it kind of looks stupid for a while. And you're not sure where it's going to go. And then you add the background stuff, and then you add all these other things, and you erase a lot of things. You add a little skeleton there in the background. This is a picture for a game that we are conceptualizing right now. We haven't finished it yet. Then you put more color in, and then it starts to look like something. And you color your characters. Start to do that stuff. Do you use a drawing pad? Or I use a tablet, tablet, yeah. A bamboo tablet from by Wacom. OK, you fill it all in. So. And, and someday I'll get him using Credo or GIMP so we can be a Entirely open. Right. <laughs> you got to have that. And so then it starts to look like something. You notice that you know, with a lot of your projects, you'll start it and you're all excited. Then you get halfway done and you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or half your team is gone and you don't know where they are. And then you start to shade and it starts to look even cooler. All right. Add some background details, shade it a little bit, and you've got, let's see, oh. just a little bit back. I'm concerned about the skeleton. Is he OK? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He doesn't look so good. He's very much dead, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. How long was that time OK, so I took, it took me 40 minutes to do that, real time. I was actually doing it pretty quickly. I did it today at the conference while I was just sitting around. and. You know, sometimes I'll take six hours to do a drawing to make it good. So for most of the drawings I did for Hexapod Defense Force, it took me three hours a bit. So it takes a while to do art. And so I guess a programmer just needs to learn to be patient or he knows it and he's patient. And, and so you'll get art over like a two-week span or something like that. You'll be waiting for or two, two or three days, and you'll start to get assets, and then you can start working with them. But I guess the other thing that you can learn from it is that you can start a project and it really doesn't look like anything until the end. And then it starts looking cool. And so I guess the most important thing is to push until the end and it starts to look like something. And then you can be happy with it. Anyway, OK, so there's that video. So let me show you a sprite sheet. Assets. Let me show you a boss. OK. So anyway, this is what a sprite sheet looks like for the game. So I hand drew all of these characters. <laughs> There's this. One, two, all eight of them. They're all different. They're all unique. And they're slowly animated. And so the computer program goes in. Joseph says, OK. And I measured it out. So this one must have been you know, 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And so this one's at 200 pixels, but it's still you know, 100 across, 100 across, 100 across. I'm not sure exactly how it works. Wish I could program. It's magic. Steven. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know. Maybe the most important thing that you can learn from this is that you can take a heathen like me and make something out of it. You know. And so, basically, that's how it's worked. Do you have? You guys have any questions about this? Yes. So is that just the mouth action? Is all we're getting there? 
Yeah. So there's there's mouth action, and then the arms move up, and then the wings, wherever these things are. It's an alien. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> all right. These bulb things. I mean, every time that I went to draw a new sprite, you know, I took the old one, and I dumped it. Or, you know, I did an onion skinning thing where I would trace over it. But each one is new and unique, and I had to color it again and redid it. You gotta show them the next stage, like the damage stages. Okay, so let's see. All right, and so that was the main. That's just when the boss was moving around, and then I did a damage state, and so you shoot the boss for a while, and he gets damaged, and then these sprites start to show up on the top. And it's the same thing, and then he gets damaged even more, and that starts to show up. And you want to explain to him how yeah. that works a little bit? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk okay. about that. Okay, anyway, any other questions? All right, well, yeah, go ahead. So, I guess while you're waiting, like if you aren't waiting for the artist to do the art, should you just create some mock-up art? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that, so, here. So you're saying that your animation is only these eight panels. Right. That's, that's all it is. And it goes back and forth, yeah. so a, a right. So it looks like his mouth is Uh huh. Like in this case, I think it ran one through eight, and then it would go eight to one. So one to eight, eight to one, yeah. one to eight, eight to one. Yeah. Is that how that worked? Yeah. yeah okay. Um. Yeah. For actually, no. I I think that was the most. Well, I would draw it and then I would put it into After Effects and you know hit run and I would watch it animate and I would watch him flap and I'd be I we would get to the point where I'd say okay it looks good, and usually it would be eight frames. You know you're watching something and it's usually ten frames per second, it starts to look smooth. Okay, anything else? Let's see. What we'll are revisit some of this because there's a few tricks that that on the development side you can do to kind of help things look better as well. So the artist isn't as, as burdened to mm -hmm. do things. Right, so did a lot of spread. After Effects, you can do that difference between two frames and actually create a new frame in between the two of them. And you can do all kinds of really cool things. Oh, yeah. You basically cheat with the orange flow, so you don't have to create that, um, that, that extra frame. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That's why I was curious. You know, what, what you just described there was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting concept. I, I we're still learning about a lot of that stuff, and maybe I can, you know, draw two frames next time. That'd be <laughs> so. I also did a font for this game. Here's the font. You can no, you can't see it. Anyway, <laughs> right? If you could see it, you know, it'd be A B C D E F G, and then you have space, space, your characters. Nice thing about having a font. Well, I hand drew it, so you have a hand drawn font. You can make your own font. Put it in just, your game. Sorry. Go ahead. But really quick, the red lines, um, Love can interpret this, and it looks at the red lines, and I'll show in the code where we do this. But it actually will interpret this and build a font out of this, mm -hmm. using the images, and it'll make its own, its own font set from that. From a PNG. Like what we've got here. Right. So I made you know, three sizes. I guess the nice thing about having three sizes is that it scales well. Yep. Can you yeah. see what that looks like? Rendered? Let's see. Yeah, within the game. Yeah, you see the white on white? <laughs> <laughs> this is the white on white? No. Um, I'll, I'll bring it up and we'll kind of show you. Right. You'll see it within the game. And it was kind of cool. You know, you would type something out and it'd be in my handwriting, but with hand drawn stuff. Okay. And I think that's it for me. Uh, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the really important thing when you're doing the fonts is that red line needs to be one pixel. And you don't have anything on either side. <laughs> but, okay? Or else what happens is you end up with a font, a character, that is zero pixels wide. Mm. And that doesn't work very well. <laughs> right. Okay? And using Git was nice for me because I didn't know how to program. I didn't know a lot about it. But, you know, this is the file that we used to program the game. And he would put the PNG files in there, or I would draw them and then. It would make it easy for me to change, change 
or draw upon and change because you know, I didn't know how to program, but I could manipulate the pictures and then they save it in there. I didn't have to learn a lot of programming. And so I guess I'm just saying there's hope for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. Are there any more questions for Stephen? Okay. So, yeah, like Stephen said, uh, by using Git, we were able to collaborate. I mean, that's kind of Git's big thing, right? That you can do collaborative stuff. Well, another really handy thing is that Love is incredibly easy to launch. You don't have to compile it. So we've got our, uh, our game over here, um, right here, HDF game. And in it, I have my code base, my source. So I've got main.lua, which kind of bootstraps everything. And then I've got all my different dependent files and imagery and such. But for Steven, all he had to do was grab the file and launch it with love. Doesn't that sound great? Launch it with love. Okay. <laughs> so, so he would just drag it on. It would fire up. And now he can see his asset. Or he can hear his music. And he doesn't have to come to us and say, oh, let's compile. Or, or let's wait for, for some build server to finish. Now, for larger projects, that could be problematic. You know, where, where you actually need compiling. You need a little bit more power than what love will give you. Okay? Um, but for us... It worked beautifully because I was no longer a bottleneck for Stephen, and Stephen was no longer a bottleneck for myself. Okay? This probably looks familiar to a lot of you. This is actually being rendered by that font that he drew. Okay? So uh, it looks pretty awesome, in my opinion. Okay? Um, and it, it works well. And, and the cool thing about Love, once again, it's cross-platform. So when I started, I didn't have a Mac. Um, I, I end up uh, using this. It's, it's my work laptop, but I've got a, a Linux laptop that I'm usually on at home. And I was able to do all my development on Linux. I'd push. He'd fire up source tree. It's really easy. Hit pull and drag his folder, and he'd see all my changes. He'd make his changes, commit, and push. So that, that workflow was really good for us. Okay? Same thing when the musician was involved. Okay? I could record just a little you know, me sounding like a sheep. Okay, but now that file's there, and the musician doesn't need to know anything about what we're doing. He just overwrites that file and commits. Okay? So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit, and let's kind of look at the history here. And this is the part that's terrifying for me, because uh, when I started out, um, I did not know Lua. Um, I had done some PHP, and I had done web programming. Anyone here done web stuff? Okay? And game stuff? Has anyone done both? Yeah, it's a very different beast, right? You know, you, with web, you have your request, you do your processing, you deliver it, and you're finished. With your game, it's not stopping. It keeps going, okay? And any little mistake you make keeps getting worse and worse and worse, <laughs> okay? But if we look at our, uh, our history here, see we've got quite a bit of history. And I went through and I made some tags. And I'm going to check these out. And you guys have to promise not to laugh too hard. Um, no actually, I think I can just do this. Challenge declined. <laughs> okay. So let me bring up my actual. Okay, that's got it. And this, this is actually from before the latest version of Love. Okay, so the current version of Love is 091. This was from 080. Okay. Um, You'll see this and you go, wow, well, that looks the same. And then it, it won't look the same here in a minute. Okay? <laughs> so if you can't read it, it says, press enter to start a new game, escape to quit at any time, left controller Z shoots once, holding spacebar fires rapidly, left and right arrows move. I think this is ready to ship. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Straightforward, people know how to play this. Okay? And, uh, and this is, this is kind of to answer your question that you had back there. This is what my artwork is like, OK? So let's see if I can, I can do this here. So here I am, and there's my enemies. And I'm just going to let these guys have it here, OK? And I'm done. Game over. <laughs> OK? This game that you guys just saw was what that arcade cabinet ended up being, OK? It's a little different, right? It's changed a, just a bit from when we started. This is what gave us the idea for how the game would work. If you look at it, I'll, I'll do it again. Okay. 
So I'm shooting up. For those of you that have played, you know, the bullets come back down. I try to dodge the bullet. Something hits me. It's over. <laughs> okay? Now, the current iteration of the game has, you know, you, you can take more than one hit. There's ways to get your life back. Your bullets shoot up a little bit higher, and things look a whole heck of a lot prettier. <laughs> right? But this is essential for the whole development process. You need to take something, build a simple prototype, and make sure it'll work before you go through all the effort, or your artist will hate you. <laughs> okay? There's nothing like asking someone to give up their time okay, and of their talents, and they put in hours and hours and hours, and then you say, you know what, that idea isn't all that good. Okay? So make sure you've got a prototype, and you, you kick it around. Have a few people test it. Let them know that it's going to be ugly. You're only testing some functionality. Okay? Um, and you don't spend a lot of time making it beautiful. That comes later. Okay? That's the last 10%. Okay? So the first thing you got to do is you come up with an idea, and then you go and you prototype it. And that's where, where love is just awesome for this. Um, you guys saw it loaded quickly. It played smoothly. It was great. So now let, we're going to actually examine some of that code. <laughs> okay? And this is where I hope things don't get too ugly on me here. Let me. I hope people can see. Can I do this and make it bigger? Ooh. It's bigger. I can. I can biggie size it. Oh, that's big. OK, can people say that OK still? OK, so um, are, are people in here, anyone here really experienced with Lua? OK, I'll give, I'll give a really quick primer since I didn't see hands fly up. So I know you guys will benefit from it. OK, Lua, when you require a file, um, will return what that file um, would have done. So instead of using a slash, I use a dot. So I've got a library um, for collision management that uh, the community has produced. I've got a library for game states. Anyone want to take a guess at what a game state is? State of the game. Well, that's obvious. Yeah, back there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so. When you, it's the state of the game, as someone said. That was, yes, obvious. But, um, so a game state would be like, yes, it's paused. Or I'm playing the game. Or I'm at the game over screen. Or I'm changing my settings. Okay? So I've got a game state manager. And then I've got a camera manager, which is dealing with things like um, I'm zoomed in. I need to scale the whole view. I need to rotate the whole view. That way I don't have to take the, the assets and move them all and figure all that out. I can just take the camera and rotate it. It's easier that way. People think the whole thing's moving. It's really just the camera. Okay? Um, I've got a timer that lets me do things like, I'm going to do this in five seconds, or I'm going to do this in 30 seconds. So the player picks up a power up. I'm going to give this player plus 20 speed for five seconds. That kind of stuff. Okay? Um, then I've got signals, which I actually never ended up using, but it's a beautiful library. You guys should check it out sometime. And then I got vector stuff, which I actually ended up not really using. And then I've got my game states, which we'll go into in a minute. And then I've got these functions that really should not be here. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, I showed this to one of the, uh, the Love 2D developers. And he said, what the heck are you thinking? This is wrong. Okay. These should be somewhere else. And we'll get to that in a bit. But uh, I made these functions for doing things, like add an enemy, figure out this stuff when, when things collide. Okay. And then down here, I have this function called love.load. Okay. Everything that is love 2D related starts with love. Dot. Okay. So love.load fires up. Okay. That's the first function that love 2D will call. Okay. So so I fire my game. It's going to do things like hide the mouse, set the graphics displays to the right size. It's going to output to my console game loaded, because at this point, I didn't even know if the stuff was working. <laughs> okay. um, it's going to register my, my game state handlers. Notice how it's game state dot. That's because I've got it up here. Game state equals blah, 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 blah. Okay. And then I've got game state switch. Switch to my intro game state. Okay. Everyone with me so far? Okay. 
So then it goes into my intro game state. And it says, when I enter my game state, I set my counter to zero. I load up my logo. You see this love.graphics.newImage? Okay. That will take just about any image format that is raster. It doesn't do vector yet. Sorry, guys, they're working on that. But uh, it takes it and it makes an image data object out of it and returns that for you. Okay. So I've got this intro table, which is kind of like an array. I say, hey, my logo, it is, uh, it's this file. Okay. Now, love is really cool because it determines where it's running. And it also makes sure that you save things in the right spot. So you don't have files showing up all over the user's drive. So it makes it really easy to build an installer and an uninstaller. Okay? It's also smart because on Linux, it's going to put it in slash home slash user dot local slash share slash love slash the name of your game. In Windows, it puts it in, if they're on uh, 7 or 8, it puts it in their system drive slash user slash their username slash. So you don't have to worry about all of that because that's really tedious. And that would really slow down your prototyping. Okay? Then you see I've got this, my fading. You know, if I'm, if I'm greater than 255, and we'll get into that later, set it to 255. If I was smart at this time, I would have done a math.max, which is just a built-in Lua function to say, grab the, the, the highest entry, or math.min, grab the lowest entry. Okay? And then there's this intro update with DT. Now, an update function is probably the most, the most powerful portion of, of the whole program, okay? This gets run every single frame before drawing, okay? So in this case, it's doing all these calculations every single time, okay? Um, so on, on my arcade cabinet, that's 60 times a second it's doing this. It's pretty important to keep this stuff efficient, okay? For example, never, ever, ever put a love.graphics.newImage in the update loop. Okay? There is no reason to be loading an image every single time from the disk. That's just bad. Okay? And then we'll skip the key press for now. And then, then after the updates, it runs the, the draw method for my game state, which in this case sets the background color. And then I just do a love.graphics.draw. And I say, draw my logo. And then it's x, y, rotation. And, and the wiki is very thorough. We'll, we'll go through that in a bit so you guys can find stuff quickly in the wiki. But uh, essentially, I just say, here's my data that I, that I loaded up earlier. Draw it for me. I don't have to worry about you know, how it's being interpreted, how it's being read, what the format is. It just takes care of it for me. OK? I see some people are starting to fall asleep here. So I mean, are we, are we OK? OK. <laughs> yeah, so the last thing is key pressed, okay? That is a callback that happens every time a key is pressed. And it passes in a constant or, a, or an enum, sorry, that says this is the key that was pressed, okay? So that does single stuff. So there's key press and key release, okay? There's another function called love.keyboard.isdown that you use inside of your updates for continuous things. So like pushing and holding the space bar, okay? So let's take a look at how that that looks here. Okay, so you've got the same the same stuff, you know, and then my my lack of knowledge here saying, hey, I'm entering the game. <laughs> my update, if I'm dead, switch to game over. <laughs> you guys starting to see how this works? It's very straightforward. Okay, I've got my collider object, and I'm saying update this. You know, update my whole collision hash and make sure if things are bumping into each other, run their collision callbacks and all that fun stuff. Okay, and then I've got a table, which once again is like an array, that's saying, here's all my bullets. Go through every one of my bullets and update their position. Okay? And all of my bullets have their own update function. So I keep things nice and modular. Okay? And we're going to look at some of these entities here in a minute. But the idea is, if you keep your, uh, your entities nice and separate, you use a little bit more CPU, CPU overhead, but it's a whole lot easier to debug stuff. Okay? Use a little bit more memory. You know, for Android stuff, I'm learning that that's kind of tricky. <laughs> You've got to work that out. But in most cases, it's well worth the, the overhead because your development time will be you know, half of what it would have been otherwise. Okay? So I go through my bullets. I go through my enemies. I update my timer. I update my player. And then it draws. 
And here it's saying, hey, each shape in my collision tool, draw it. <laughs> so you guys seeing how, how this is very simple and very straightforward? It reads well, you know, and, uh, and eventually, and, and I'll show you this. I know I keep saying that. I've got to stop saying that. You'll see it all. Um, Stephen, I was able to make a function for him to make his own cutscenes because it reads so well and so easily. Okay. So the last thing here before we move forward in time is uh, my entity for the bullet. So I make a bullet. I update the bullet. You see, everything follows this pattern. <laughs> everything. By being consistent, it's a whole lot easier for other people to help you out. OK? So any questions thus far? Everyone's with me? OK. So let's, uh, let's fast forward in time. OK, so here, we move forward. And you think, you know, by now, these guys must know what they're doing. And if you thought that, you'd be totally wrong. How long ago would you be at this place where you were? Um, this is probably six-ish months. It's got the date associated to it. I could show you guys. So we thought we had the coolest name, Endless Firefight. It's great. OK, and I started messing around with tweening. You guys know what tweening is? Sometimes called in-betweening. Yeah, what's tweening? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so tweeting, like you've got a start and you've got an end, and you say, let's, uh, let's move across from these positions, and I want to take five seconds to get there, or I want to take one minute to get there. Okay? So I thought I was cool because I did this. You guys see that? <laughs> okay? You guys can see it again just because it's so amazing. Okay? Okay? And rather than going in and writing my code and saying, move left, move left, each update, what I did is I used uh, linear interpolation. Okay? And I went through all this effort, and it was just before I did this, and then I showed it off to the Love IRC channel, and they said, that's great. Why didn't you use the tweening library? <laughs> okay? The tweening library... Once again, all these are under a really nice license to use, so don't be afraid to use them. Um, sometimes be afraid of their names. The community is a little, eh, sometimes. But um, these libraries are awesome. Don't be afraid to use them, especially when prototyping. When you're prototyping your stuff, like we were at this stage, you don't need perfection. You need close enough to tell you if your idea is worth using. Okay? Um, anyone here make spaghetti? How do you know when spaghetti's done? You just throw it to the wall, right? Okay. This is the equivalent of that. We are throwing stuff at the wall, just trying over and over and over. And eventually, we're going to find stuff that looks good, like this. I mean, I thought this was pretty good. I mean, this could work. But it ended up not fitting our game. Okay. And then I think, th I think the game still works. See? And now it's all scaled right. And I've, I've got acceleration going on. And my, the, the balls are filled now. And you see, I've got little labels for scores now. And I lost again, because I'm no good at this. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but the game's most of the same. But during this whole time, we've been, we've been throwing ideas against the wall and, and figuring things out. Okay. And at this point, I came to the realization. Just, yeah. I was just going to say, it seems like a lot of games that are out for mobile devices are like super simplistic. Uh -huh. Is there a certain amount of people who embrace the old-looking, basic-looking game? Do you always do not want to go all the way to really smooth and modern looking all the time? You'd be surprised, even on those games that look really basic, um, how much effort goes into making them look that way. Okay? Um, like, uh, okay, here's a good example. Mario. Okay? The original Mario. Okay? You guys have all played that, right? Super Mario Brothers. You know, we could get the tune going on. You know, everyone knows this, right? Okay? There were hours and hours and hours spent on Mario's you know, tiny, tiny pixel 16 whatever, 16 by whatever space. Okay? Um, and in current games, there's a lot of effort. Yeah, there is a certain level of polish, depending on who you're targeting, that you'll want to have. But uh, I can guarantee you it's more than we had here. Right? <laughs> okay? So here, I even started getting really clever and tracking how long people were alive and their total score. Okay, I'm getting fancy at this point. Okay. At this point, we 
were you thinking one bullet was going to kill you forever? Yes, yes. So, see here. Or hitting guys. And I, I've got little power-ups here that make you turn faster and make me die. Yeah. Yeah. But I felt pretty good about this that we had here. Okay. Now, um, if we go back to the code, which is confused now because I totally checked out a new... Uh, New version here. Okay, so if we go to the code, my main loop or my main didn't change much. But you see, I've got I've got these different ideas. I'm trying. I had a gravity bomb that was pretty cool. Um, sucked everything in. Ended up being a terrible idea for gameplay. But uh, but if I look at our player, you see, I started to track some different things. I I said, hey, how rotated is the player? Okay. How long has the player survived? So I'm initializing these. And then down here, I'm saying, if we frame, let's see, where's my self dot? It should be here somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. But I started to track things like, oh, let's start adding, let's start, uh, let's start adding how long the player's been alive and tracking all this stuff. Okay? Once again, by keeping the code nice and modular, I was able to move forward. I still wasn't. Excuse me. I still wasn't adhering as good as I should have. Okay. But one important thing to note here is I'm making heavy use of DT. Okay. The amount of time that has passed in seconds since the last frame. Okay. Um, there's nothing like making your game, and you've got VSync on, so you are 60 frames a second every time. The spacing's nice and even between your frames, so your game's all the right speed. And then you give it to someone and they don't have VSync on, and now everything's running three times faster. Okay, makes a game like this really hard. Okay, DT is the great normalizer. Okay, so I'm able to say, for example, my speed. I take my current speed minus my acceleration times DT. Everything's times DT. Yes. Delta time, current time minus last time for a frame. Okay, you will use that everywhere. And you'll probably find a few times where you're like, why isn't this working right? And it's because you used DT twice, or you didn't use it when you should have. But it's very important to check for those sorts of things. Or when you release your game, or you give it to your testers, they will see a totally different game than what you've done. Now, granted, I've gotten some pretty awesome results with that before. But it's, it's not what you want to be doing, okay? especially when you're prototyping. Okay? Any other questions before I move on? Sending stuff to the to the uh, group, the gaming group, and to like regular normal humans as well. Uh, and did you learn? Uh, what did you learn differently from those? Okay. Well, the the uh, Love Two D group is very good for technical feedback. Um, I was learning at this point, and I found that more often than not, they're saying, "Well, why didn't you just use what was built in?" You know, I write these really complex like physics functions. And I'm still using them in the current game because I was just so proud of them. <laughs> and then they came to me and said, you know, we've got Box 2D physics library built in, right? You can just, you know, love.physics, make some fixtures, you're done. <laughs> I'm like, I, that's great, but I spent three weeks writing this, so I'm going to keep it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Um, I'm bad at math, so it isn't in this case, but I'm proud. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I, I remember a game I had called uh, Pongo. And you had this little guy, and you'd kick these bricks, and you'd squish the monsters. was how it worked. And uh, we had it on like this 8086. And then we upgraded. We got a 386. And Pongo, the whole game, lasted about half a second. <laughs> okay? It's important to keep track of these things. Computers change over time. They get faster. They get, some are slower. You're going to have a wide audience, different platforms. Delta time is the great equalizer. <laughs> okay. Where does delta time get set? Is it the um, yes, love actually handles that for you. There's a function called love.run that you can override with your own 
if you want to. But the default love dot run has been good enough for me, especially for prototyping. Um, but yeah, that's where it sets it. Is there? It just finishes drawing everything, and then it goes, okay, checkpoint. Then it kicks the next one, okay, checkpoint, and it starts comparing checkpoints for you. Okay, and it automatically takes care of that for you, which is really nice. Okay, any other questions or comments? I mean, you guys make the presentation, so. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, then you can see down here, I'm drawing once again just the graphic and, and so on. And then I started trying some different ideas, like I had the shockwave thing where you fire it and it go and, and push everything off the screen. And it was way overpowered and just didn't work. But the whole point is, by keeping these things nice and compact, I can go to a different game, okay? And I can say, you know, that shockwave idea I had, it might just work in this game. And I can pull that in. And now my prototype is that much further along without me expending all this effort, okay? That's another great reason to use version control, even if you're the only one on a project. Because you might like what you built six months ago, and it might be really handy for you, okay? It's my enemy and so on. Okay. If there's no more questions, I'm going to fast forward a little bit more. This is like the TARDIS right here. Okay. Now here, we started to actually deal with animation. Everyone sees this sprite sheet? They've got, I point at my screen like you guys can see. Everyone see this sprite sheet here? Um, this was our hexapod. You notice he's sideways. Um, that's because I rotate him before drawing him, because that's just how I did things at the time. I probably didn't have to, <laughs> but it worked and it stuck, and that's what we, we stayed with. Once again, it's a little confused because it doesn't like everything disappearing. Well, I suppose I should run it first so you guys can see just how awesome this is. Now, this time, we got really fancy. Because, you know, we kept that name, but then we thought, you know, maybe there's a different name. And we actually titled the, uh, the bar Gravenundrum. Now, that's a game name, right? Okay? <laughs> and this time, I started experimenting saying, you know, full screen all the time might not be good. Because I gave it to a tester, and they had a bug with their graphics driver. So whenever Love would go full screen, it would hard lock their machine. They were not pleased with me sending them builds of my game. <laughs> okay? But it was very important, they, and they, they got over it, you know, they were like, oh, that's great. And now, it's really hard to see, but he actually moves, okay? His, his little legs move, and he goes off, oh, he dies. His little legs move, and he runs around, and kind of bounces around, okay? And this was, this was really cool, because he'd, he'd move, okay? And, and Stephen was so excited about this, because he's like, I made a sprite sheet, and it worked, okay? And then I made, I made this... Uh, uh, what's called quads, which let me take an image and split it into image data and draw the quads, which is much faster for graphics rendering. Okay? And, and it was just awesome. And then I showed the Love2D community, and they said, why didn't you just use the animation library? <laughs> okay? But it worked, and I was, I was so thrilled, because I was like, this is starting to look like something. Okay? And... Uh, and I even had, I mean, you guys will get a kick out of this. See, I'm, I'm shooting. And see that score thing? I mean, that was the bee's knees right there, <laughs> the score. OK? And that time, I did use the tweening library. <laughs> OK? Because you can tween anything. And this is where we started testing the idea of, of having really sneaky enemies that come at you from the side. You know? Can you, uh, can you arc your bullets to hit them? Does it take too long for bullets to go up and come back down? You know, is that, is that concept going to work? We ended up determining it's really awesome because the player panics. And we wanted the player to feel a sense of panic sometimes. But bullets take too long to reach them. So let's give them some troops. And they've got to keep those troops alive. And if any of you, any of you have played the game, um, there's, there's these troops that help you out and, and will combat these ground enemies. But, but at this point, we started thinking about Less about how do I feel about the game, and more about how are other people starting to feel about the game. Okay? And it wasn't even really a game yet. It was still a prototype. Okay? This is all just experimenting. We're still throwing spaghetti. You know? But 
we're starting to involve other people in that spaghetti toss. Okay? We want other people to be giving us feedback and say, you know, this is a great idea, or this is a terrible idea, or it's way too hard. That's what they kept saying with this. Getting hit once sucks. <laughs> okay? I don't want to do that each time. Um, but I, I still kept the difficulty. Anyone here ever played the game Super Hexagon? By Terry Kavanaugh? That's such an easy game, right? Okay, I can last like 62 seconds on the easiest setting, and like four on the hardest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, that might be your target market. That might be how you're approaching things. But in this case, it didn't work really well. It didn't fit with our goals that we had. Okay. So we started thinking about, well, we should start uh, keeping track of, of player health and, uh, and moving, moving forward. And this is where we started. Let me see. OK. I think this is the one we want here. This is where we started adding some really nice pictures. You know, This is like of my backyard here, just so you guys know. This is going to be like the most branded presentation ever. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I added an achievement system, and holy cow, he's on a platform that is so incredibly large because I wasn't scaling it at the time. <laughs> okay, but he's even got oh, not in this version, but uh, but I started to mess with. Okay, how are these bullets going to look on the background? Okay, if the bullets are the player's worst enemy and the player's creating them, the player better be able to track them, right? And uh, we found that, you know, one pixel points don't work well for that, okay? So we started moving into, okay, well, let's try different ways of making these bullets look. And we replaced them with, instead of a, uh, a point that was just being rendered, we threw an image in there. We gave it a, a size, gave it some substance, okay? And then in a future version, I forget which commit it was, I, I probably got it, oh, there it is. And that's such a great tag name. Presentation 5, Ugly Art. Okay. So we started getting, let's see if I can make a full screen here. Can I? Oh. Oh. Booyah. <laughs> I had full screen implemented. <laughs> okay. So here, we actually had smoke. You see that? Okay, now this is, I, I had learned by this point that, uh, that everything I was doing and going to the love community with, they were saying, why didn't you just use what we've already built? Okay, that's kind of been a recurring theme here. So I got smart and I looked through the wiki and I saw this lovely entity type or object type called a particle system. Okay, and I made, this, I made this particle system because I went to the forums and someone said, here's my awesome particle system. Go feel free to rip it off. <laughs> so I did, and it was great, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and then I fine-tuned it and fine-tuned it. So just to give you guys an idea of how these, these particle systems look, let me uh, bring one up for you guys. Entities, let's see, player. Aha. Uh -huh. So inside of my player entity, I've got smoke. And smoke is a new particle system. Once again, see, love.graphics. OK? That accepts image data. This is my smoke particle. This is my little dot. OK? And in this particle system, the buffer is going to be set for 1,000. So I can have 1,000 of these little dots. Okay, so it's going to allocate that memory. That way, the system isn't slowed down too much by allocating and de deallocating all this memory. You know, referencing and dereferencing and all this technical stuff that I really don't know because I'm just a Lua guy. Okay, but uh, but this way, it, I wouldn't have to track a thousand particles in Lua. Okay, the Love Engine would take care of tracking all of them for me. Okay, then I come down here and I say set emission rate zero. This particle system is not making any particles, okay? Because when you're not shooting, you better not have smoke coming out of the barrel. There's a problem there, <laughs> okay? 
and then set speed, set gravity. These are all well documented. Um, and then I started to set my colors. Okay, so it starts out being kind of a gray, and then it changes to a white and fading out is what this does. Because I've got R, G, B, alpha, R, G, B, alpha. Start, end. Okay, you guys all know color channels, I hope? All right, okay. You don't? You sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, alpha, this is something that I'm still learning how to take advantage of. But I thought alpha was transparency. Okay, who here thought the same? Okay, so maybe everyone here knows more than I do. This is ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, alpha is just additional information. It's another channel. So um, what I'm learning now, so I won't be able to show you guys because I'm still learning it, is shaders, GLSL shaders. Um, you can take a block of GLSL shader you know, uh, code, you know, and you can feed it into love, and it will leverage it properly, yeah. which is really awesome because you don't want to have to edit each pixel for some effect. You want to be able to say, hey, graphics card, take care of that for me. Okay. And it will do it a whole lot faster than Lua will. Um, I generated static. My static at 1920 by 1080 would take about five seconds to generate on my i7 machine. Okay. That's kind of unacceptable. You know, it kind of kills the frame rate. Um, but with shaders, it's instant. It's real time. You don't wait for it. Okay. And then I've got some other things. You know, I'm setting the spread and so on. But with this code, I made my particle system. And then when I shot, I set my emission rate to 50. So for a split second, my smoke is going poof. 50 little particles. Okay. And I don't have to keep tracking them. It's going to automatically kill them off when the time comes. It's going to fade them out. It's going to look pretty cool. Okay? So I made this, and my son came in. You guys all saw the smoke a second ago. I don't need to bring it up again, right? Okay? And my son came in, and he saw it, and he said, oh, a train. <laughs> okay? but, but my point is, there's a lot of things you can do. We don't have a whole lot of time, and I'm wanting to make sure there's plenty for questions, and, and you guys can kind of see parts of the code that you want to see. You know? But my point is, love is a very powerful framework, um, especially for games like what we did, the, you know, these 2D things. Okay? Um, and worst case, even if you don't use it for the final product, it makes an amazing prototyper. Because you don't have to set up a whole build environment. You don't have to go out and uh, worry about licensing for your framework yet. You know, if you end up going with Unity or something, there's licensing concerns you have. Okay? You don't have to really invest a lot into it to start getting results, to start seeing what your game could become. Because okay? there's nothing more depressing than working on something, taking forever, and, uh, and not really making headway. You know? Well, I just spent a week, and now my build system works. <laughs> you know? That's not very motivational. right? Especially when the artist says, well, I just spent a week, and now I've got a spreadsheet ready. And you can't use it. Okay? So it's, it's really vital to have something rapid. Even if you don't end up sticking with it long term for your, for your game, it's really good to prototype stuff out. It'll save you a lot of headache. Okay? Um, what? Time? Okay. So um, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for letting me present. And if you guys have any questions, I'll still be around after the presentation.